Stephen. Dr. Greer, welcome back. Thank you very much. Great to be here. <laughs> You've done so much, it's hard to give you a proper intro. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> thanks. I appreciate your help. You, you've got the uh, one thing that I want to kind of pick up where we left off and then really go out to some more serious stuff today. You've got the C-SETI program going on, and we didn't get there last time. Let's talk about that a little bit. No, it's actually the heart of what we're doing, and I'm glad you brought it up. If you go to CSETI, which is C-S-E-T-I dot org, you'll see that what we've been doing since 1990, for 17 years now, is that we have formed um, interplanetary uh, contact teams that are ambassadors from Earth to these visitors. And it was based on the idea that, uh, unfortunately, no government uh, on the planet has a peaceful diplomatic outreach to these visitors and that it was very much needed that the humanity have a, a peaceful face that it was showing to uh, the universe rather than just a military face. Thank God. And for this reason, we started this project. And if you understand um, Sheldrake's morphogenic fields and the power of consciousness, you'll understand that when you start having thousands of people go into unbounded mind together and remote viewing space and making contact with these extraterrestrial visitors, um, it causes a shift uh, that goes uh, beyond space and time as we know of it and affects literally the whole direction of of how Earth is moving. And this is really the the heart of what CSETI and the Disclosure Project have been doing. It all starts from inside. And I think that Uh, Based on the experiences I had as a young man uh, where I had contact with these visitors, it was very clear to me that while they are uh, technological civilizations and they have very advanced um, uh, electronics and, and energy and propulsion systems, that they also understand that the conscious mind within us is a singularity and that it can be used for communication and that in fact their technologies interface with coherent thought and from an expanded state of consciousness. And I think this is something that was certainly understand by the people who um, first put down the Vedas in Sanskrit uh, unknown thousands of years ago. And what we're seeing in our own project is that we organize these training expeditions. The next one's going to be on Mount Shasta in California. Uh, in late August, and the details of that are at csetti.org. And what we do is that we spend an entire week, uh, we're in the afternoon, we um, train everyone in the uh, techniques of meditation and deep consciousness and remote viewing so that they can go from a state of universal mind and see deep space and make contact with these extraterrestrial visitors. And then we go out at night using lasers and electronic equipment as well as group consciousness to show them where we're located. And we have never had an expedition where we haven't had these ET visitors show up, literally. We just came back last week from uh, Crestone, Colorado, where we had 50 people out in the desert, and uh, we had a number of amazing contacts that happened. One was that we had about a 300-foot diameter um, disc-shaped craft that was beautiful golden color, that appeared and literally didn't fly in from space or anything. It just appeared over the desert uh, not far from us and was there in communication with us for about uh, five minutes before it just, uh, the videotape is interesting because you should see it almost imploding into time, space, and vanishing right in front of you. And, of course, people were astonished as this was occurring. But what we're doing through this is training people to do this and then go back to their local areas where they will become the educators of the masses as this information gets more disclosed, but also will be the advanced diplomatic team uh, because the United Nations doesn't have a team doing this. Um, no. The government of the United States doesn't. The gov- no government in the world, I know because I'm working with all of them. Now we're mm-hmm. in the process of training some of these governments to do this in a peaceful way so that it isn't a, a project that's totally dominated by a rogue militaristic approach. But in the meanwhile, we individuals who are just ordinary citizens who have no official standing uh, have the right to say, look, we are conscious denizens of the cosmos, and we need to be ambassadors to the universe. And that's the title of the training program. It's called Ambassadors to the Universe. And and that's really what CSETI has been doing since 1990. And 
Um, in fact, the next, we're going to put out a book, I hope it's this fall, that's going to recount the 17 years of contact experiences that have involved uh, literally thousands of people that have been on these expeditions. And we now have operating teams all over the world, in Australia and Europe and in, in the Mideast and the Far East and Canada and the United States. And we think it's very important for people to understand that if we begin to do this as a large group of people, knowing the techniques of uh, higher states of consciousness, as well as these physical sciences that interface with these extraterrestrial communication systems, what you'll begin to see is that that will move the world in that direction because the world has to be moved by leadership. And we have to provide that leadership because our political class and our uh, big financial and military operations simply have uh, dropped the ball on this since the 1940s. And so uh, I think that this is a critical part of what we're doing to not only uh, make peaceful contact but manifest a future where we will be able to have open contact with these interstellar civilizations within the framework of universal peace and within the framework of understanding that the conscious, intelligent mind that's within all of us, whether we're human or from another star system, is a singularity. And, you know, and this is based on some very good science that Dr. John has done at uh, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Lab and others, uh, as well as the, the early work that was done uh, in, in quantum mechanics where uh, uh, it was acknowledged that uh, the total number of minds in the universe is one and that the conscious field of intelligence is a singularity and that if you understand that and if you understand that that is the field from which all matter and time and space and energy and thought is emanating from, then you can begin to understand how these civilizations are not only communicating but are traveling through interstellar distances and and that is the state of consciousness that we have to attain if we're going to be suitable ambassadors to these other interstellar species and that's the core of what the CSETI project is really all about I actually do understand that and it, it's it's not that hard <laughs> it, it, especially if you can experience it. it it's amazing how simple it really is no it is and it's very simple and in fact one of the things that we did um when we were in creston we went to a meditation center and i did a meditation for everyone where everyone went into this state of unbounded mind and then we saw the entirety of uh the cosmos manifesting from that state and it was a really transformative experience for people. And I think that, that what happened is that then that night we went out and had the most amazing contact uh, that, that I've been discussing. Because what happens is that I believe that these extraterrestrial visitors, all of them, no matter what star system they're from, if they're capable of going faster than the speed of light, which you have to be if you're going through interstellar space. You can't go right. know, using solid rocket boosters and the junk that we're using on the space shuttle to go interstellar. <laughs> and basically, if you have that understanding, you also have the understanding of the cosmology, which I talk about a lot in my new book, um, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, because in that book I describe the fact that the structure of the cosmos is that the totality of mind pure consciousness is present in its completeness at every point in space and time and paradoxically all space and time is emanating from that field of, of conscious intelligence and once you understand that and you understand the extraterrestrial visitors understand that these concepts of contact become very very uh, clear and very simple uh, and I think that Oh, before I was an emergency doctor, I was a meditation teacher. A lot of people don't know that. And I used to teach people the Vedas and, and Sanskrit. I used to tutor people in Sanskrit, actually, and, um, and do pujas and uh, teach meditation. And what I found is that as I teach people these techniques and then combine it with this knowledge, so you have an operating system based on higher states of consciousness for making contact, that these extraterrestrial visitors say, yes, this is what we're looking for. We're waiting for humans to get it and to get it at that <laughs> level of understanding, and then they show up. And so that's really what we're training people to do. So when they show up, what kind of experiences are you all having? Are, are you okay about talking about that on the program? Oh, sure, okay. absolutely. And, in fact, um, 
uh, I go into this in some detail in um, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, uh, which you can get at disclosureproject.org. Fabulous book, by the way, if you out there listening. Um, it's worth having, and it's a great read. So. Well, thank you. And, yeah. and that's my own personal journey, but I recount a number of experiences we had. For example, um, a few years ago we were in uh, England, and we were in this area where a lot of these crop circles had been appearing rather mysteriously. And then, and this was back before they were all being kind of hoaxed and whatnot. But, uh, and we had a team, and we decided, you know what, let's go out to this area. And we had an 1,800-acre estate that was at our, our, our disposal to use. And we uh, did this protocol, and that night uh, – we had this ship that came overhead and created this enormous cloud and rainstorm right over this area. <laughs> and it caused all the, I hate to use the word spies, but interlopers and people who were interfering with what we were trying to do to, to leave. And then about an, uh, two hours later, uh, we were on the side of this uh, field. And right in the field, a few hundred feet from us, appeared a, about a 100-foot diameter disk that was completely materialized, beautiful, with these celestial colored lights uh, moving, bleeding into each other, every color you can imagine as it was spinning counterclockwise in the field. It was only about 10 feet above the ground, and so we then, of course, went into this craft in consciousness and could see the occupants, and they were communicating with us. And we were also signaling to it with some lights, and it was signaling back. Uh, now, what was interesting is that at that time, there was someone who was with us who had not been trained in being able to be centered in this higher state of consciousness, and she became very kind of freaked out. And at that point, at the moment that she began to be anxious, uh, it had been floating very, very close, much closer to us. It stopped. It picked up her fear, yeah. and it backed off and then went up into the, the mist and the clouds. And what was interesting is that I was holding a compass, and the compass I had – of course, it's magnetic field uh, compass, uh, began to spin around counterclockwise with the ship. And it <laughs> did that for an entire hour because <laughs> the ship went up into the uh, clouds above us, and then the clouds opened up after about an hour, and it was this beautiful uh, amber globe that was above us. And we signaled to it again, and it flashed back, and then it took off into space. And they're very, very gentle, and, and it's it's very interesting how they... Uh, interact with people, and they really are very keyed in on people who are in a state uh, as, well, as, as uh, Krishna said to Arjuna on the battlefield, a little of this eliminates all fear. And the this he was referring to is this state of pure consciousness or pure clear mind. And if you're in that state and you can go beyond the, hum the normal sort of animal state of fight or flight and fear, they will come and be very close. We have actually had extraterrestrial life forms that have appeared right near our contact team, have touched us. Um, I mean, it's just amazing the level of contact we're having on these expeditions. And uh, I think that people have to understand also that at this point, we have a number of uh, governments around the world uh, that are interested in this and are wanting to make open contact using these same protocols. And we're in the process of setting up protocols with some very powerful uh, governments around the world who want this to happen because they know that we're being visited, but they don't know what to do about it. And so, at least they aren't shooting at them. <laughs> yes. Well, this is <laughs> you know you have a rogue military group that pretty yes. much does what it wants. And you know I was meeting uh, a few days ago in Washington, um, where I have a home, with one of the presidential candidates um, who who is um, running for president of the United States uh, this, this next year. And we were having a discussion about this, and, and he knew that we were uh, putting weapons in space for the purpose of uh, targeting and shooting at these ET visitors. He did not know that we had, uh, unfortunately, successfully done so. And I was explaining to, to this man that how important it was to understand that we get control of these projects and that we have a different approach to, the, to these visitors that's based in, in uh, peace and in higher states of consciousness. Unfortunately, you know, this is not something that has become uh, the main thrust of, of our government yet, but we do have very promising developments um, in other governments around the world, and they are looking to um, see SETI 
to set up an operation where we will make contact with these extraterrestrial visitors so that their heads of state and their leadership can have a personal meeting with these visitors. And this is actively being set up even as we speak. It's a very sensitive project. I can't go into a lot of the details, but um, it's a very exciting project because it's finally there are um, mainstream uh, senior government people around the world who get it and get the God. fact that we are uh, very much running out of time to deal with this properly because we have, um, you know, this, this other element that uh, has a enormously powerful project uh, that is uh, based on conflict and targeting these visitors. Uh, we know, for example, that um, even as in remote areas of South America that we have uh, Star Wars uh, space-based weapon systems that are uh, hooked to ground-based uh, reconnaissance systems that have recently targeted these extraterrestrial vehicles and have shot them down using very powerful uh, electromagnetic type weapons. And in fact, uh, we know of one event, uh, or two events actually, in South America that have happened in, in the fairly uh, near future here, past I should say, where uh, there was loss of life by the occupants. And um, it's a real tragedy. I mean, one of these species are very peaceful. Um, the one craft that was shot down was a uh, egg-shaped ship, and the adults are only about two and a half feet tall who were on that ship. And uh, there was loss of life, and, and this is something that uh, is a tragedy and very, very sad. It makes me sick. And yeah, it's terrible. And, and of course, you know, when, I, when I've done briefings at the Pentagon for senior uh, admirals and generals there who, who are concerned about this, they're not in control of that. I mean, most of them are not in these compartmented, very tightly controlled projects, and, and they're at a loss as to what to do. Most of them have very, very little, if any, knowledge about this. And this is why, you know, I think it's very important that people who are listening, or they say, well, my God, what can I do? Well, you can become an ambassador to the universe. You can learn how to do these protocols that involve consciousness, coherent thought, we use uh, lasers and, and also electromagnetic tones that we project out in space so that they get a very clear vector of exactly where we're located, and then learn what to do when these ET craft show up. I mean, instead of just running around like chickens with our head cut off, which is what most people do when they have a <laughs> you know, actually do something purposeful with, yeah. with a higher intent that moves this whole dynamic along in a positive way. And what I have told people is that if they give this a chance, and learn how to do this, they'll be astonished at how much these ET visitors will respond and say, yes, we really have been waiting for this to happen. Yeah. I I, I find it amazing. And, it, again, it's just so easy to be able to get into that into that place. And, you know, the multidimensionality, the transdimensionality of, of these crafts is just phenomenal. And and I'm so glad you're doing this. It's so needed. You know, it sounds like science fiction, but it's honest to God real. And, um, you know, one of my questions is, uh, speaking of the, the shadow parts of the government that the, that the regular guys, shall we say, don't really have access to, is, is it true, do you know anything about the fact that there, there are myths, that there are agreements between our government, I don't know about other ones, and ETs uh, for different purposes, for technology exchange, that kind of thing. Well, that's a very popular myth. There's not yeah. a scintilla of evidence that's true. And I'll have to tell you that I think that that's part of the disinformation nexus that goes along with trying to convince people that there's at least one or two interstellar species that are uh, worrisome that would then justify Star Wars. Remember... Uh, for example, the 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 whole uh, operation with the Cold War. You only needed one other country that you were locked into to justify a multi-trillion-dollar military-industrial complex. So, if you want to to ensure that the one trillion dollar a year military-industrial complex can be grown into the future and into space, you need to put out carefully crafted and even believable stories that are false flag operations that have to do with these ET visitors so that people will say, oh, well, there may be a thousand nice ones out there, but there are these one or two worrisome ones, and that will justify the uh, fear uh, and stampeding people through fear into accepting the costs 
and the sacrifices required for weaponizing space. I believe it is all disinformation. We have been all over the world with these contact teams and have made um, contact with virtually every type of ET uh, species. They are working together. Uh, it's not as if you're allowed to leave your body. Here's one of the real thing, things that people never think about. Even the, the world has the United Nations, for crying out loud, as right. primitive as we are. There is an uh, organized structure in space, and you are not allowed to leave your biosphere and go interstellar until you have become a peaceful civilization. It doesn't happen. Uh, because if you try to do it, you're tossed back like a bad penny. How do we know this? Because I know for a personal fact that we have developed faster than the speed of light technologies. In fact, Ben Rich, who is the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, said this to us a bit before he passed away, that we already had the means to travel among the stars faster than the speed of light. Oh, sure. But you know, we're not using them. We're not going out there amongst the stars yet. Why? Because this ET coalition are saying, no, you cannot go out there. In fact, we weren't even allowed to colonize the moon because, and remember, my uncle designed the lunar module. He was a right. senior project engineer that designed the because we were going there as a competitive species as part of the Cold War race with the Soviets in the space. They do not allow people of any world, not only Earth, but any other planet, to go out into space beyond their biosphere in any significant way until they have become a peaceful global civilization. And I think a lot of these other myths that are out there are disinformation programs that have been developed to indoctrinate, particularly, I hate to say this, the New Age and UFO subcultures, yeah. so that a certain belief system evolves that when they eventually announce that we're not alone, they can say, and by the way, some of these extraterrestrials are worrisome, and we need $10 trillion from the world economy to build weapons in space and defend the homeland of Earth. It's kind of like the movie Independence Day. And that movie was a script from the secret government, you know, when Will Smith says, let's kick alien butt, you know, and I'm going, yeah, right, as if any species that are capable of interstellar travel would have to be engaged <laughs> that way. You know what? You know, We're going to stand you, there and take it, right? <laughs> yeah, as if. I mean, it's so ludicrous. And, you know, I was having this conversation with a, um, uh, a senior military guy a while back, and I said, look, if any of these civilizations were hostile, it would have been point, set, match, about the time we detonated the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site in 1945. No there kidding. is no way that any civilization that's hundreds of thousands to millions of years more developed technologically than we are and are easily traveling through interstellar distances would allow us to continue on the path we've been on if they were nakedly hostile and against the human interest. In fact, they've shown enormous restraint. They don't fire we can, when we fire on them. Exactly. We can prove that they have had loss of life and we've shot them down. But I'd like for these people with all their conspiracy theories to show me what part of the earth has been conquered by them. No, yeah, really. It hasn't happened. So I think that we, the other thing people have to understand, and this gets into some stuff people don't like to hear about, but it's well, let's talk about it. <laughs> is that the covert programs that have been working on this have had technologies since the 30s and 40s mm -hmm. that are electronics that can simulate almost anything you can imagine. Okay, they have what are called alien reproduction vehicles, which are uh, things that look like a UFO that are made by Lockheed and Northrop and uh, Science Applications International Corporation, a few other of these big, huge, multi-billion dollar Beltway Bandit corporate operations. Those have been used with things that are called program life forms that are, or stagecraft. Uh, one of the documents I have describes the stagecraft that's been used to simulate extraterrestrial abductions of people and mutilations. And this has all been part of the psychological warfare to raise a false flag operation so that eventually people would be afraid of all things alien, quote unquote, and support the whole militarization of space and the militarization of the relationship. Right. You know, if you're going to have a war or a conflict, you've got to create an enemy. And unfortunately, the UFO subculture, and, and in particular the, the, the New Age subculture, has this false dialectic and uh, duality going on about this issue that is completely part of a disinformation program. And we have proven that by not only uncovering 
these operations and getting firsthand witnesses who, who have been part of these uh, false contact scenarios using advanced man-made uh, things that look like UFOs, but also by going out and making contact ourselves. Say, you know, forget all the speculation and armchair talking. Right. Let's go out there and make contact and see what these ETs do, and let's see what they're really all about. And we have had nothing but the most wonderful, peaceful experiences. So, it, you know, that is in sharp distinction to what you would hear in most of the movies and, and UFO conferences and videos and books. And, are, and are you saying, forgive me for interrupting, are you saying then that there is no such thing as abduction? Yes, there's no such thing. There's extraterrestrial contact where people have been taken on board, but they're not being abducted. Abduction is an act of violence. And there, there are simulated ET abductions, which are being run by human covert interests using these um, alien reproduction vehicles that are made by Lockheed and others. Yeah, we got into this a little bit last time, and I found myself being confused when we were done, and that's why I wanted to clarify. So, okay, so people are being taken aboard crafts. You're not calling that abduction. I, I, I could go there. And, and then sure, people have been having contact with these visitors probably since the dawn of humanity. So who's making the scalpel marks and leaving the bruises and things like that? Yes, well, these sort of operations are uh, almost uniformly being done as counterintelligence operations by the secret government uh, groups. Because and, and there's a whole book that's out called MILAB, M-I-L-A-B, by uh, Helmut Lammer, who wrote it at, after I had given him a lot of documents about the fact that there were these military abductions going on. And it's interesting because one of the documents I have from one of the institutes, it's a private institute that works with this covert group that was given to me. It's a very top-secret document. It describes staging abductions for their psychological warfare value, and it uses the term stage craft in it. And that comes up in some other documents we have. So we know that a lot of what has happened to people uh, is that. Now, for example, one man who was an army ranger who was involved in that operation uh, back in the uh, 70s, he told me, he said, you wouldn't believe how many people and also military and political leaders have had family members or themselves abducted by us humans, making it look like an alien encounter so that they would learn to hate the aliens and support the Star Wars military buildup. This is easily done. Believe it or not, what I'm describing isn't difficult to do with the technologies that have been in development since the 30s and 40s by these classified projects. And this is one of the big missing links in this whole area of discussion. How much of what people think is extraterrestrial is actually extraterrestrial, and how much of it is actually man-made false flag operations designed for their psychological warfare value. Well, how do they decide who they pick up? Well, I think there are a lot. For sometimes it will be people of uh, high interest. For example, I know one of the royalty, um, royal families in Europe have had uh, the man I met with had his brother uh, abducted by these uh, covert military groups. They thought it was, uh, quote, aliens, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. And it was done so that that whole family, with all their vast resources and, and monies, would support the uh, uh, quiet little war going on with these visitors and support the whole Star Wars initiative. We know that other times individuals will have this experience just because they want it to get out into the public, and then those people who have been abducted will be sent to certain abductee support groups um, and be uh, basically used as a vector for getting that information out. Same thing with the cattle mutilations. You know, the, there was only one real scientist who ever investigated that, Dr. John Altshuler, who is a fellow medical doctor, and he told me he had concluded that almost all of those were simulated UFO events that were being done by our military because of its psychological warfare value. And this is absolutely true. So you start looking at this whole area of, of study, and you begin to find that it's like a mirage in the desert, or it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz that has the old man pulling the ropes behind the curtain. And you have to then reevaluate all of it to say what part of it is real and what part of it is Memorex. And, and I think that this gets to be something most people don't have a stomach to do because they really want to take everything at face value. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with these shadowy intelligence operations, you can't take anything at face value. These guys are masters of this kind of darkness and this kind of deceit 
And that's how they have manipulated not only the wars we've had in the last 50 years, but manipulated the masses of people into certain kinds of positions and belief systems. And I think we have this, like the, the, the in vogue song, free your mind. You know, we need to free our mind from all this hogwash right. and actually go out there and make contact directly and find out for ourselves. But you know what? Most people won't do that because of fear, because they'll say – in fact, I've had people say to me at lectures, and they, they afterwards will say, well, I think what you're doing is interesting, but I'd be too afraid to go out to some place and do this because what if they showed up, and what if they did this to me and that to me and this to me? And, and I said, look, you know, you've just had your mind colonized with fear, and that's exactly where they want you to be because that's how they control these yeah. transnational – the kleptocracy that runs the world right now controls through fear. Yeah. Fear is a very powerful way, and it's the opposite of love. And if you understand the power and the contagion of fear, you'll understand how easy it is to launch this kind of xenophobic nonsense, and people will become afraid, and they'll go, oh, my God, that might happen to me. And therefore, they sit at home in their houses looking at the idiot box instead of going out under the stars and making contact. What I tell, I'm telling people is that blow through all that fog of disinformation. Mm -hmm. It's like the Matrix in the movie, and I'm going to give you the red pill, honey. And it's like, <laughs> you know, and, it's, <laughs> and you've got to go past all that nonsense and see what's really out there. And when you do, it's actually incredibly beautiful. And all this other scary stuff is something that's been manufactured to control people. Well, uh, do they pick up, does the, does the government disinformation stuff actually pick up people who are taking aboard ships? Uh, say that again? Uh, okay, say somebody is a contactee mm -hmm. and is taking aboard ships and does have experiences. Does the government get involved with those kind of people also? Sometimes they have. <laughs> Sometimes they've attempted to piggyback uh, these disinformation contact events mm -hmm. that are, are to discredit the contactee, maybe or confuse them. So uh -huh. they don't know is it real or is it Memorex. And it's sort of like, you know, if you have a few gold nuggets, if you dump a, a mountain of fool's gold on top of it, right. you know, most people it, it, they get completely confused. And there are very few people who have enough information to do a proper assay to see which one is gold and which one is the fool's gold. And these classified projects uh, using advanced technologies, electronics that interface with consciousness, I might mm -hmm. point out. You know, people talk about MK Ultra and all the L S D experiments. That's these, nothing. These things that's nothing compared <laughs> to what these high tech radionic psychotronic technologies are in combination with these uh, man made UFOs that have been used to, to sow all kinds of fear. And one of the men, by the way, when I was doing this briefing for Congress back in 1997, 10 years ago, in fact, it's hard to believe. and um, we were, uh, it, was, it was before we did the disclosure project public announcement, we had uh, a number of military uh, and astronautic people there. One of these men had been involved in the early 70s in putting together the logistics for a hoaxed extraterrestrial attack on Earth using alien reproduction vehicles, ARVs made by Lockheed and Northrop, and using these other technologies so that there would eventually be this sort of false attack that would then stampede the world into fear so that this militarist economic junta could consolidate power and unite the world, not in peace, but in fear. And that is something that is fully operational. It was fully operational by 1974, uh, 33 years ago. So one of the things that I've been doing when I go to the Pentagon, and I have done briefings for the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I have personally briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA director, is to expose these uh, dangerous, rogue, uh, plans. Unfortunately, the public, and particularly the UFO public and, and the New Age community, have no knowledge of this, and so they don't know whether this account or that account is real or false because they don't have the background. And what we're trying to put out through our disclosure project information is enough data 
that people can begin to connect the dots because they really, really need to understand this if you're going to not be fooled again, as the old rock song says. You know, we won't be fooled again. Well, unfortunately, we are being fooled again. And I think that this is one of the things we have to struggle against. We have to fight against this. And we're responsible for the knowledge that we have, and we're responsible for our actions that come from that knowledge. And knowledge ultimately Uh, as it says in the Vedas, is the greatest purifier. And if we have the knowledge of the truth, as well as these other countermeasures that are false, we can have discernment. And in that discernment, we can take a path of right action. And that's why we feel that this, uh, you know, we spend an entire, on these retreats, I spend an entire week with these people who come to not only give them this informational background, which you can't do fully in an hour, but also to give them the experience out under the stars so that they can feel secure in forming a team of three or four or five or eight people wherever they live and become an ambassador team to these visitors and be free of the disinformation and step into the truth about this issue and without prejudice and without fear, make open contact. Sure. How would, how would people sign up for that? I hear, I hear people saying, oh, i got to go there. Well, if you go to uh, cseti.org, that's cseti.org, there's a um, list of these training expeditions um, and the dates and the locations. I think the next one... Uh, well, we're actually doing a, a small one for a long weekend up in um, near Montreal in Quebec um, that's going to be in August, uh, the second week of August. And then late August, we're going to be up on Mount Shasta up until about September 1st. And that is a wonderful. We've had amazing things happen up there on the Oregon. Oh, bad. Um, I learned how to talk to them up that way. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> and um, then I, in uh, November, we are going to be in Palm Springs and up in Joshua Tree National Park doing a week. And that one is really deeply focused on, as a meditation retreat um, as well as a contact expedition up in, in Joshua Tree. So we do these, you know, uh, four or five times a year. And um, my goal in doing these, a lot of people say, why do you waste your time still doing this with a small group of people? Is that I said, no, it's very important that the average person be trained to be an ambassador because the day is going to come when if our governments around the world can't get their minds around this and take intelligent action that's peaceful, it's going to happen anyway where open contact is going to begin to happen, and all of these CSETI teams and all these people who know the truth about this will be the points of coherence and the points of contact in their local areas. And it's very important that we have hundreds and, th- and even thousands of people who understand that and are trained to do it and, are un- and understand the difference between the false scenarios and the actual ET events and the way that these ET vehicles appear and the difference between, say, an alien reproduction vehicle that's made by Lockheed and an actual ET spacecraft and how they function and how they look. We go through all of this, not only in terms of knowledge, but the experience uh, of it. And so I think that it becomes very, very clear to people after a week. It's a very transformative experience for people, not only in terms of higher states of consciousness, but in terms of them stepping into their empowerment as an ambassador to the cosmos, which is what we need more of. We need people to not view themselves as just, oh, gee, I'm a housewife or I'm a doctor or I'm a secretary or what have They need to say, look, I'm conscious and intelligent, and the intelligent light of mind that's within me is a universal resonant field. And I can get into that state and be an ambassador to these visitors, and I need to be because our governments and our leaders have uh, basically – lost their way and have allowed in the vacuum of that inaction uh, this cabal of militarists to take this matter over. And the only way that's going to change is for we the people to gather together and do this. And I think it's very important that we're talking about this here, you know, right around the time of, of uh uh, of Independence Day in the United States because, you know, the spirit of the founding of the United States was was this kind of empowerment of the individual uh, and, and, and groups of individuals to make a very big change in the world. And, and now it's time for the next level of that evolution uh, of humanity from uh, a peaceful world to a universally peaceful world. 
And that's really where our destiny lies. Our destiny lies not in Star Wars and, and the sort of whole end-of-the-world eschatological fear-based nonsense that's proffered by most mainstream uh, orthodox religious people, but this understanding that we've actually entered a whole new era, that the old world is already dying all around us and a new world is emerging. And this new creation is one that's going to be a cycle of unbroken universal peace for 500,000 years. That's the time we're in right now. We're in the time of one whole era closing and another one opening. Yep. And we're at this we're at this in between, you know, at the very dawn of that early one. But it's very important that those of us living at the dawn and witnessing the opening of this era step into empowering it because the celestial and empyrean realm can't manifest on earth except through us. And this is one of the real mysteries of, of the connection between individuality and the universal purpose, is that we have to understand that that happens through us. And you can't just sit around watching Jay Leno and eating Cheetos, and it's going to happen by itself. Right. It's not like a Ouija board. So this is where getting into this state, taking responsibility for it, and then stepping into that empowerment is really, really important right now, and we need a lot of people doing it. Well, when you guys um, call in the uh, call in the ETs and they come, are they bringing messages to y'all, or, or are you just at a point of kind of an exchange of presence at this point? Oh no, we have very definite messages and information. That's what are they saying? And, well, it's just a lot. I mean, it's beyond the scope of this interview, but the, sure. the key the key. Uh, message is that they are very happy to make contact. They're very concerned and have actually asked our group very specifically to intervene to try to get these uh, very dangerous weapons stand, stood down or, or, or shut down. Um, and they are also very much uh, concerned about the continued suppression of the energy and propulsion systems that uh, actually have been on Earth now for almost 100 years mm -hmm. that would get us off of oil and gas and coal and the other things that are killing Mother Earth. I mean, you know, one of the things people need to understand is that every planetary body is actually a living, conscious biological organism. Yep. Not a human. I don't want to be anthropocentric here. But Earth is actually a living, conscious being, and she, it is a female, is really, really struggling under the abuse that mankind is placing on her right now. We need to lift that burden, and we can, because one of the projects that we're very involved in is getting inventors and scientists who understand these new physics behind energy and, and propulsion systems to come together as a group to make contact uh, together uh, and also tend to work to form these energy systems because a lot of people say, well, why don't the ETs just land and give it to us? Well, it would be like giving a, a supercomputer to a caveman. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, first of all, their technologies emerge from a uh, etheric and astral template that resonates through the uh, zero-point energy field and the electromagnetic flux field and manifests seamlessly without any seams or parts as a single operating thing. That's true. I, I mean, know. If you, if you understand how these ET spacecraft manifest, they're not cobbled together with rivets and, and you know, hammering together pieces like a Boeing 747. These are very, but we have, you know, since the time of Tesla, humanity has had this information. Mm -hmm. and what a crying shame it is that here we are 100 years into this era and we're still burning fossil fuels and oil and gas and coal. And in the process... And denying the fact that anything else exists... Exactly, and that's the other thing we're looking for is people who can work with us on that project, uh, who not only can provide the financing and funding for a whole new industry to bring these technologies out, because our group has identified the very best people on Earth who understand the physics behind Excellent. it. Excellent. And we want to put together an R&D operation where within a year or two we would be able to come out with things that would completely replace the need for oil. What about uh, transmutation? Is anybody doing any serious work on that? Oh, it's been done. And, of course, if you understand uh, how matter is supported at this finer structure of... Uh, I do, actually. Then it's really not... The, the physics behind that is understood. And mm -hmm. there have... In fact, there's a man I'm working with who has a plasma arc generator that has been putting waste material in it. And on the back end of it is coming out silver and stuff. I mean, just trace amounts. But that we're not in the material going on the input. And, yes, there are ways to do that. And 
Uh, you could take uh, one of the technologies that we know exists. You could take all the radioactive waste in the world and run it through this uh, generator, That's and out would come for. innate material. Now, why aren't we using that to clean up all this nuclear waste? Well, because that technology involves this whole new area of physics that results in tapping into this field of free energy. And if that were disclosed, it's goodbye Exxon, goodbye oil, goodbye coal, goodbye right. central utilities, all of it. And a lot of people don't realize that the secrecy around this whole um, ET issue has to do with the power greed and addiction yeah. that the two or 300 elite corporations and individuals have because they realize that if it's acknowledged that we're being visited, the first thing that's going to be asked by anyone with an IQ over mud is how are they getting here? What is the science behind this? And when that's asked, it's going to be answered. And when it's answered, it's the end of the world as we know it, as REM said in their famous song. And I feel fine because you know what? That whole fossil fuel era of earth-destroying cannibalism where we've destroyed the earth for nothing but greed, that needs to, we need to shut the door on that chapter and say, now we're going to start a new chapter. And you know what? All of humanity will benefit except – you're going to have a decentralization of power because these technologies allow for every little village to have free energy, clean water, refrigeration, transportation, without pollution, and without being hooked into this centralized petrodollar-based uh, conglomerate. And, you know, it is a wholly different economic structure, but you would actually begin to have justice in the world and abundance and peace. So, you know, all of these issues are tied together, and we understand that very well. And this is why the disclosure of this issue, and with it, of course, the technologies that would come after, is very key to the future of the human race. Yep. <laughs> it's it's just, it mind boggles me that, that, you know, there hasn't been an uprising of people saying we really need to understand this, you know, that such fear can be prevalent in in the place of acceptance of such wonderful things that we could be receiving and using and, in fact, already have in many cases. Yeah, the irony is that, you know, right now the United States is spending over $5 billion a year to study global warming. If right, my study had, it. If we had 1% of that budget, which would be $50 million, we could put the best R&D team together you can imagine and have at least half a dozen of these technologies out within one to two years that would completely stop all global warming. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when I've had these kind of conversations with, quote, the big money people, they go, they don't doubt it. And then they go, oh, but that's too big of a change. You know, it's like they don't, they say they want, it's like Al Gore, an inconvenient truth. Well, here's an inconvenient truth. We have the solution. Step up to the plate and embrace it. You know what? Colonel Corso in 1956 uh, when he had contact with an ET that had landed out mm -hmm. on the Holloman Range, uh, and the, they, the ET was asking him back then to shut down these electronic radar systems that had been configured as disruptors to the electronics of the ET craft that were coming to Earth. Mm -hmm. And the ET asked the colonel to stop that. And the colonel said, Colonel Corso said, well, what's in it for me? He admits this. I mean, I've seen his actual personal diaries and papers. And the ET said to him, a new world if you can take it. And you know what? Here we are 51 years later, uh, and that happened in the summer of 1956. I think it's time that we say, all right, it's time for us to take it. We are ready to move to the next level. And many people have been ready for many decades, but we have got to combine together and make it happen. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> it's just it's time. You I mean you look around and you see what's going on. The trees are dying. The yep. the, the entire ecology, the ecosystems are changing. Oh, it's it, heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, it just breaks my heart. And I travel a lot. I know you do. Right. And and if you know, for those who are comfortable at home and don't go too many places or very often, you don't realize how much is devastation there is in this earth until you get out and start seeing it, and then go back to a place five years later. That's right. And, you know, you can do your own little thing, but ultimately, you know, I mean, my wife and I just got a, a, a new 2007 Prius, and it's great. It gets 50-some 50, 50 miles per gallon. But the fact of the matter is it's still using gas when we don't need it. And it, what good is, you know, in a way, you know, you try to do your own part, but in the next 10 years, China and India alone are going to put online 
650 new coal-fired power plants, which will double the current level of greenhouse gases and pollution, double in the next 10 years. And what are we doing about that? Well, the only solution to 6 billion people living on this planet is to completely replace the OS, the operating system, meaning the oil, gas, coal, internal combustion system. The, that, the good news is that we have the knowledge to do it. The bad news is that we have not found the financial partners and what have you to come forward with the funding to create the new technologies in a way that would be robust enough to run your house and car. That's what we're looking to do next, in addition to making this peaceful contact and disclosure happen. That's awesome. So we, so we have these three key programs. Um, and by the way, the technology um, uh, effort, you can see it, seaspower.com, S-E-A-S, power.com. And the Disclosure Project, where my new book and, and other uh, materials are available from these military witnesses, is Disclosure project.org. And then for these trainings uh, that we do on these expeditions to make contact is uh, cseti.org, C-S-E-T-I.org. Right. Um, and, but there are links from all those sites to each other. Um, but, you know, I think we're, we're really at this point where uh, we're going to find that uh, more and more people are joining with this. I've been very encouraged, for example, uh, we've been calling for governments around the world to open their files on this. And I don't know if you know this, but after uh, I interviewed with you last time, the French government released 100,000 pages from their space agency of previously classified documents, and there was so much interest in that that it crashed the French government uh, <laughs> server. It really Yay. did. And now the British Ministry of Defense the, in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. has agreed to release another eight or 9,000 investigations and cases, which will be tens of thousands of pages that have been classified. And we have a very strong interest going on in certain quarters uh, in the United Nations and the European Union. And so I see this is moving. I think we need to pick up the pace, and we need everyone's thoughts and prayers and meditation to, to, to put uh, this into the kind of uh, protection to make this happen because uh, we have to uh, realize that, uh, that we, it's not like we have another 50 or 100 years to make this transition um, uh, unfortunately, we don't because they made linear calculations, and those are not true because it, it, it's a holographic situation that we've got going here. Right. It's exactly. it's not exponential. It's holographic. That's correct. And, yeah. And you know, we we really have to make these changes very quickly. Mhm. Mm yeah. Everybody wants to study it and talk about it, but if by the time they get finished with all of that, there are going to be a lot of people gone. Right. But just with the with the water rising, and I'm not into fear stuff. I mean, it's just a fact. So, um, I mean, we really do need to ex not just explore this stuff, but act on it. So, I'm really glad you're out there doing this, Stephen. It's a yeah. We're very uh, you know we're we're deep into the consciousness and meditative aspect, but then we very much focus on action. And you know, we have to to learn to put those two things together: the the higher purpose and state of consciousness with very clear action to make this transition a reality. I love it. I love it that you're out there acting. You're, you're, you're getting this information and you're doing something with it, which is a lot more than most people do. <laughs> a lot of people just like to make waves, but they don't want to do anything about it. And uh, you're, you're really out there making a difference. I did notice about the French thing and the, and the British thing. And I'm thinking, isn't Belgium coming up with something? Or was that, am I just thinking about that? Uh, yes, the, the Belgians, uh, Belgians have been involved, and of course, all the way back uh, when I first visited the Belgian Air Force uh, and the Belgian uh, the nation uh, over in uh, 1991, I believe it was. You know, they had all those events where they had uh, uh, t uh, tens of thousands of people saw these enormous uh, triangular ships that were at very low altitude floating, floating outside of Brussels and in and, and eastern Belgium, and uh, the. Uh, I think there were four NATO stations, uh, radar stations that tracked it. I saw some point. footage or something on oh, that. Oh, yeah, we have that. In fact, I have the photograph of that oh. and also the uh, uh, the footage of the uh, radar tracing. Uh, and so they were, have been very much wanting this information out. And see, I, what I see happening is that there are progressive, uh, forward-looking elements that are in uh, the Far East and in Europe who want this information out and are supporting disclosure and open, peaceful contact. And if America continues on the course of uh, obfuscation and lying about this, 
basically it's going to be left behind in the dust because it's going to be left in the dinosaur era. And I think that it's very important that we make this clear to our leaders that uh, whether it's congressmen or senators that are now home on their uh, recesses from Congress is that, look, go to disclosureproject.org. This is not just a bunch of nonsense. This is, you know, people that we have hundreds of, of top secret military people who have their documents and evidence and radar cases and everything else on this website. Go there and learn that this is happening and that they need to support the kind of action that the British and the French and others and, and have been taking and the Belgians. And also in South America, we have had we have seen, uh, for example, the Chilean Air Force releasing uh, their uh, information. Um, we have seen similar actions being taken in Brazil. So I think that this is the, the momentum is in that direction and not into this sort of a cabal of secrecy and manipulation that's just so 50s. It's like, get over it. I know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's like watching some other reality, isn't it? I mean, how can, how can there be such ignorance? It, it, it just boggles me that, that it's such a two-edged sword. There are people like you that are doing this stuff like me that's trying to get this information out, and then, and then there's this whole other thing where – it isn't real, and you know, like you say, so fifties. That's ex- and you know when you go to New Mexico and you go to Roswell, it's still nineteen fifties. It's like a time warp there. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's, it's such a disaster, and the whole mindset uh, is like that. And and so what we're trying to do is elevate the whole uh, discourse not only in terms of evidence and scientific approach, but the consciousness behind it. Because you know we're a hundred years into the time when. Um, uh, people people uh, have understood the connection between consciousness and matter and time and space. I mean, this is... Uh, well, and it's all know, part of each other. You can't have one without the other as far as I understand it. And it's it. been understood even by scientists uh, yeah. for that long. And so it's time for the world to acknowledge that and move forward. It seems like uh, you know we've been in this sort of state of arrested development for 50 to 100 years. And, and uh, while there's been some advancement in society... The core central way that the world is functioning is still very old world and very uh, much uh, belongs to the past of the of the dawn of the industrial uh, revolution in the mid to late 1800s. And and I think that we need to understand that many people will hear what I'm proposing and think it's very Jetsons and very futuristic. I go well, actually, We're this is, these are all things that could have been firmly established before I was born, yeah. uh, certainly by the, the 1950s. And um, so I think that uh, we have to, to say, look. That we're capable of doing this, and it's going to happen because enough people uh, share this information with each other, begin to make contact openly in a peaceful way, and also pull their resources to make these technological advances a reality. And this is really Im- important because we have got to understand that uh, Gaia is only going to give us so much time to before, you know, as the old saying goes, the earth will cast off her burden. Uh, you cannot uh, continue to, to abuse the immune system and circulatory system and biosphere of a planet like Earth without there being dire consequences. And we need to acknowledge that and, and take the proper actions uh, to lift that burden and to create an entirely new way of living on the Earth that's not only peaceful, but that the fundamental way that we live on the earth isn't violent. The way we're living now with the current technologies is violence. It's violence against the earth. It's abuse. And each other and everything else. And uh, we don't have to be that way. That's right. We can make a better world, and that's that's what we're all about. Yeah. Well, I don't know where this hour went. I could talk with you all day. (laughs) Oh, my God, yeah. Well, I guess it's... uh, uh, time flies when you're just uh, staying in the flow, I guess. I know. I just love it. I, I didn't have a prepared list. I knew we would do well, and and um, you're, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you, and, and I can tell you that our audience loves you, and uh, I'm really grateful to have you back, and and um, maybe in a few months we can do it again. Maybe, um, you know, and I, I, I would love to uh, come on one of your ventures one of these days i'm going to have to clear my schedule and plan ahead it would be Uh, great to have you'd love it i think we'd have a great time yeah we would i already actually understand what you're doing so it would be a breeze i would just like to participate and and um 
get some of the benefit of your experience while I'm at it. So Great. I'll do that. And um, again, well, thanks for your help and support, and uh, for getting the word out. My pleasure. Hey, it's it's the truth. We need to do it, right? That's right. <laughs> That's what this show is: conscious talk for greater reality. So, listen, Dr. Greer, I am I am honored and pleased once again. Uh, to have this conversation i wish you wondrous journeys and uh i'm here if you if you need support on anything let me know and we'll get it out there and uh in the meantime take care of you all right thank you so much my pleasure thanks right. for being here all and right. to all of you you know if we were going too fast if you want to get any of this that you missed later uh it'll be on the archive next few days and it will be on for the next year so enjoy you can listen to it anytime 24 7 uh, on the world puja network Uh, this is dr meg reminding you to take care of yourselves Um, check out my website when you get a chance i've added a bunch of new things to the web store personally picked out by yours truly that uh, i felt might be wondrous tools for people that are not gadgets and gimmicks so anyway there's that at www.spiritlightlite.com and until next time i wish you joy in your heart laughter in your days and love in everything you do have a beautiful night see you next week